Hello and welcome to the Climbing Daily Friday Gear Show. Now, uh, eagle-eyed viewers may notice that we're not in Chamonix, we're not in a studio, we're in Norway, and I'm with this man, Tom Randall. Tom, what are we doing here this weekend? We are about to head down to Recovery Drink in Jossingfjord and to try some nice spicy trad climbing. Awesome, so we're, we're doing a whole filming thing, it'll come on Epic TV at some point. But the reason we're here, shuffle around a bit, for the Friday Gear Show, is I want to talk a bit about ropes. Um, because you've just changed sponsors, you're now sponsored by Tendon Ropes. Uh, and I've used a lot of Tendon Ropes, I'm a big fan of them. So let's first of all talk about the type of ropes that you're using for recovery drink. Presumably it's trad climbing, you're on half ropes, right? Actually no, we're on a single rope and we're using a Master Pro and the reason why we go for a single rope on something like recovery drink is that you want as simple a setup as possible. You don't want to have to think about how you're spreading your two lines, which draw you're clipping with which rope. You need to concentrate 100% on the climbing. So you want something that's really light, simple, but works for the job. Because mostly when you try, like whenever I go track climbing, I think half ropes because I want to spread the load between bits of gear. Uh, if it traverses a little bit, but for you for that route it doesn't matter are you concerned about just loading one piece of gear with one rope or is that not really a, a problem for this route if the gear's good and you don't think that you've got to spread loads and you're not worried about things ripping so much then it totally makes sense to go for single ropes and i would say most of the time for really hard crack climbing i use a single rope and so does pete I suppose with a crack, it tends to not wander too much unless it's changing between cracks. You know, if you've got a crack and it goes to the top of the wall, that's kind of it, right? It just follows one pretty straight line. Yeah, exactly. And even if you transition between two cracks, if you set up the last, say, two pieces of pro on the left-hand crack to be longer draws on them, and then the first two in the next crack to be longer, it, it meanders between the two really efficiently and it's never a problem in terms of drag and you know half the time when you're on something which is right your limit you're placing way less gear so you hardly got in any, any in the end there. Um, and in terms of length of the rope so the climb is how long and how long is the rope that you're using currently? The climb I think is around 35 meters ish maybe 40 meters long and the rope we're using is 80 meters so it's just enough it's perfect. So that allows you to get up and be lowered down on certain sections of it uh, without having to faff around with different types of ropes. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realise is that if you're doing a route that's much steeper, then of course the vertical lower is a smaller distance. So you often don't need as much as you do for the length of the route because the lower is shorter. Okay, and recovery drink is super overhanging, so you come out from the cliff a lot further. And the last thing you want to do is being lowered off the B layers, uh, B lay plate and having a little bit of a fall. Yeah, I mean, you tie, a, you tie a knot in the end of the rope or you tie it into the person who's belaying. But typically on something really steep, you might have a, a 40 metre length of climbing, but the lower off is 30 metres, for example. OK, so you're with tendon ropes now, you're using the tendon master. Presumably you've got your pick pretty much from the tendon rostra of ropes. Why did you go for the tendon master? Uh, and I'm interested in this because it's a rope I use as well, so I'll tell you why I think it's good in a minute. But you tell me, first of all, what, why do you use that specific model? For me, the Master Pro was the obvious choice to take on this route because I wanted something that was skinny and light, but I needed it to be really durable in terms of the sheath. And as soon as you pick it up, it's it's got that really nice, flexible feel about it. it you know the light, the weight of it. And if you're going to work something and project it and be falling off a lot, then you don't want it to be trashed in a week. And I've definitely had ropes that are that kind of in the, the light performance red point bracket, which have been trashed very, very quickly. And this thing, I mean, it's just brilliant in terms of durability, but still really light. Yeah, because so with my one, I've used it on a beach in Thailand where it got humid, horrible. It was in the sand. I tried to look after it, but I didn't always succeed. It was in the jungle. It's been in the rain a little bit. And what I like is it's maintained the flex. And I'm sure there's a technical term for it, but it, it feels when I have it in a belay plate, it's malleable still. It doesn't stiffen up like other ropes. That's what I found. I would say it's at least 100 times that this rope has been fallen off now. And we're talking about quite a lot of big falls in it as well and it's not going stiff, it's not wearing through, I don't need to cut it, and it's still performing exactly as it did when I got it out of the box. Because I was going to ask you about that, because there's there's recommended falls on ropes and stuff, but 
a lot of people don't always follow that. Where is the point where you take a fall where you think personally, okay, maybe I should think about retiring this rope or, or is it just purely done on whether you can look at it and see the wear going on? I'm possibly not the right person to ask because I think I'm a real abuser of ropes right to the limit. But to give you an example is I've had ropes that have probably taken, I'm going to be conservative and say 500 falls in terms of the number of short to medium to long length falls and they've had multiple core shots on them and they're still fine. Everyone really panics and I, and I know people are going to hate me for saying this but they are absolutely fine and I haven't broken a rope and I still after the, all this time of having core shots on various different ropes is that they don't suddenly explode. They do eventually if you really really push it but the main thing to realize is that the ropes are often designed and engineered to go a lot further than you think. And it even comes down to, I don't know if you've done this, but once in the gym, I got a rope and I cut it three quarters through and had it down to just, I think, three nylon strands inside, then hung around and bounced on it and I still couldn't break it. And that's when I started to be convinced of how hard these things are to break. I love the fact you think I've done that. I definitely haven't done that. Absolutely yeah. not, no. Um, the second mine looks a bit furry. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just retire this thing. <laughs> um, it's good that because we, we did something with Tendon ages ago and there was, it, it, was, uh, it was Anton was talking about how the only thing that really knackers a rope is if you've got it over an edge and you weight it and it soars on, onto a piece of rock. He's like, it, it just doesn't snap. Ropes don't snap like that. And I think that is the case, isn't it? If you've taken that many falls, your rope isn't just suddenly going to explode. What you have got to look out for is where it's running over. Yeah, the, the, the cases where I've seen ropes go through the very quickest and I've chopped right through to the core every time has been when you're, you're in, a, in a crack and maybe in a dihedral and it's slightly offset so you get an aret on one side and then you fall in a funny angle so that you, you run the rope down the aret all the way and I've seen yeah quite a few times I've cut ropes right through to the core quite badly on one single fall and it's always the scenario that I watch out for the most when I'm climbing and those times that's the time to get the knife out and cut it a little bit. That's fair enough, that's fair enough. Um, so you obviously, as this conversation showed, abuse your ropes, but what are some tips you can give people in terms of prolonging the life of it, um, in your opinion? How do you look after your rope? Again, I might be a really bad person to ask this. I, I, I Everyone should come and have a look at my ropes and see what they're like after a few months and see how badly I abuse things because I'm not very good about put. I know I should put it in a rope bag. I know I shouldn't put it on the floor. I know I should wash it occasionally. I know I should use the treatment. I know I should brush it out and use the, the rope cleaner on it. But I don't do any of that. I use and abuse my ropes fully as a climber who likes going climbing and they still last a long time as you've seen on this trip and you'll see this rope tomorrow. Okay, well, there you go. So if you want to look after your rope, do everything the opposite of what Tom says. And at some point it might last a little bit longer than yours. Maybe I should write you a list of all the things that I do yes. and then everyone take the exact opposite stance on it. That sounds fair that sounds to me, good. that sounds good. Um, and then finally, uh, treatments in ropes. Do you tend, and I know you get given these ropes, you just kind of use it, but treatments are quite important for, again, for that lifespan thing. Um, is it something you think about ever and you think, yeah, okay, I can abuse my rope a little bit more because it's protected? Well, the dry treatment is really useful to have on ropes. Uh, it, you know, when you get water in your rope, it's going to really affect the performance of that rope. And a, a classic example was on this trip uh, just a few days ago. It got very, very damp and claggy, and all the moisture in the air came into the cliff, and it was, it was even kind of hanging on the, the overhanging steep rock, even though it hadn't rained on those faces, and the rope gets wet on that. And if your rope is, if it's beading on the edge of the rope and not getting right into the, the core, one, it takes a lot less time to dry. It just dries off in the air. It's not in there so that when you handle the rope, it's damp and it's getting into your skin. And it's, when you run it through drawers, it's not dripping off it. And then the performance isn't affected. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, the video of this climb that we keep talking about, this recovery drink, is going to be coming soon. Uh, or if it's out already, the link is in the description below. But Tom, thank you very much for the chat. Um, ropes are one of those weird things where it's... Like, I don't usually like buying a rope because it's kind of quite unsexy. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's one of those things you have to have as a climber, but it's not like a cam where you're like, ooh, look at my cam, it's a rope. But super important and obviously one of those things that you need to trust at the end of the day. I think ropes are sexy. You think ropes are sexy? Yeah, oh, if you, oh, you get the good colours. <laughs>
and you got combo up the right colors. Oh man, we are not on this. No, we are not on the same playing field on this. If I get ropes, oh, the colours. There we go. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone's uh, sexy thing is different. So I've learned something today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm more of a cam man. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you on The Rock tomorrow. And thank you for watching. I'll see you soon.